Uh, my name is Alex Eagle. I work on the Angular team here at Google. Um, and I've spent the last couple of years making both Angular and the programming language that we use for Angular, which is TypeScript, um, work well internally at Google with Bazel. Um, and so I've spent the last nine months or so working to externalize that and make it possible for uh, Angular developers outside to use that same tool chain. And I'm uh, Mike Moriarty. I'm a software engineer at Asana. And uh, after Alex uh, talks about um, uh, about front ends and TypeScript and Angular, uh, I'm going to be uh, talking a little more about our use of TypeScript at Asana and um, Bazel persistent workers in general. OK, so to get started, there's nothing for us to talk about. Um, it turns out that web development is, uh, sorry, am I still alive? Web, web development is, um, you know, unlike backends, uh, we don't really have any problems that require Bazel, right? Um, so uh, ra raise your hand, by the way, if you work on backends. That should be basically everybody, because why else would you be at a Bazel conference? Um, does anybody work? Does anybody work in, in JavaScript? A couple people. Oh, actually, okay. And and how many of those are? Keep your hand up if that's for Node.js. Okay, only a little bit. Okay, so there are a few people using JavaScript uh, with Bazel. Why would you do that? Um, so it's not actually true. Um, so you would think that uh, the backends have the problem of being large scale, that you require compilers, that you have a set of dependencies that you need to build before you can build your app. Uh, and in the past, maybe that wasn't true for most JavaScript apps. But uh, if we look at what we do at Google, Google Cloud Console, for example, has, I believe, 6,500 um, JavaScript files. Actually, they're TypeScript files. So it's a pretty big project. Um, and uh, this is known externally as well. So we just launched version 5 of Angular. And the, the highlight I liked from this blog post is that there are known speed issues uh, running the build with projects with more than 1,000 components. And we, on the Angular team, um, you know, internally we have uh, projects of that size, and externally people with projects of that size uh, have problems. Um, it's not all interpreted. We've kind of, uh, we, we don't have, we have compilers now um, for things like JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So Angular has a compiler that takes HTML and turns it into JavaScript. The TypeScript compiler, which we'll talk a little bit more about in this talk, turns TypeScript into JavaScript. There's a compiler, so actually several of them, to take um, CSS preprocessed language and compile them into CSS. Um, and it's not monolithic. Uh, Web Components is actually a standard now. So you can actually publish a component that uh, is, used, uh, is used in somebody else's app. And you can, Angular itself has its own component system. So we have basically all the same problems. So the celebration is we brought Java to the web finally. After so much promise, we have all of this complexity. Um, but we broke it because web developers weren't expecting us to bring Java to the web, right? They're, they're expecting the change a JS file and they hit refresh on the browser. There's zero latency there. So the, the dev refresh cycle should be near instant or else there's a regression. Uh, and like the Pinterest guy said, you can't sell somebody on a new development tool if there's a regression in their experience, even if you think it's great. Um, and so 10 seconds for build, not acceptable, at least for an incremental build, right? If I make a change, I need to see it show up in the browser right away. Um, and you can ask developers what they want. Um, you know, you could have, if you had to choose, do you want the instant developer refresh, or do you want to have compiled languages that help you not make mistakes and help you scale? And they want both things. Um, and so this is, this is, I think, well, this is one of the two challenges in web development. The other one is that web users want the same thing, right? They want to have a full application, but not wait to download anything. They just want to click a link and go straight there. Um, so I think this is what's interesting in working in, in web front ends. Um, so let's talk specifically about TypeScript. Um, a lot of this um, applies to Angular as well, but we'll talk about TypeScript specifically. Um, does anybody already know anything about type, like use TypeScript before? Uh, almost as many as have used JavaScript. That's cool. Uh, I will go through this quickly. It's a, it's a compiled language, but um, it tries to be as much like JavaScript as possible. So you take today's JavaScript, you add features that aren't available in all the browsers yet. Because you know, sadly, we have this uh, this problem in the JavaScript world that our target platform is very amorphous, and if it's IE six, then it's much different than if it's a different modern browser. Uh, and then we take parts of the future syntax of JavaScript, and we add types, and then we just compile that all down to today's JavaScript. Basically, the compiler erases the types and down levels some of these new language features into something that's uh, that's uh, compatible with today's browsers. So, for example, this is ECMAScript five, which is basically <laughs> today's JavaScript that's in all the browsers. Looks like that. Um, if we add this arrow, this fat arrow, and we have this back tick syntax for interpolating strings, that's in ES 2015. Most browsers have that now. Um, but then TypeScript will add a syntax for the types. Um, and that looks like this. Puts a colon, and you put a type there. Um, 
And of course, we now have a type checker. So this is part of the compiler. You can imagine the compiler is really two separate things. There's a type checker, and then there's the code emitter. TypeScript tries to be very convenient for incremental adoption. So one thing you can do is say, oh, I'm going to treat all the type checks as warnings, emit my code anyway, and I keep going, which we don't do in Bazel. But if you're moving your project over from JavaScript, that's a very useful intermediate step to take. Um, so here we see that we can't call hello2 with a, with a, with a numeric argument. Uh, but my favorite thing to show about the type system is that you could, you could imagine a lot of different type systems um, for JavaScript because you know, it's unconstrained, right? There's no existing type checker. All, none of the programs have types in them. So you have a lot of uh, abilities to choose what kind of types you want to add. Um, the, type, the TypeScript type system is specifically designed to match what is already happening in the browser or in the JavaScript runtime. So for example, the create element API on document, it's one of the basic DOM APIs you'd use at the very beginning. Depending on what string literal you pass to it, you get a different return type. And that's pretty weird. Most languages, I don't, I don't know of another language that has that. I'm sure somebody does. Um, uh, I'm not going to make any guesses. Um, so you can call this .href property on this thing because you know it gives you the right type. And then as I said, at the end, it just erases the types, downlevels the language features. You get today's JavaScript. Part of the reason that I'm, I'm talking about this uh, at a Bazel conference, even though maybe you don't use JavaScript, you might know people at your company who do use JavaScript. And you might sometimes scratch your head, like, what are those people doing, and how does their code ever work? You should <laughs> really recommend that they try TypeScript. Uh, it's very practical, very easy to get on board, and, it, and you know all the advantages of a type check language. Um, so uh, before we dive into how we build it, let's think about, like, so OK, it's just one more compiler, right? Like, we're all running compilers under Bazel. Why is it different? Uh, and I've thought of a couple of things in these slides. Probably we could talk about more. Um, so one of them is that uh, we have different target language levels. Um, so for development mode, we want to be able to produce uh, one language level, which is something that runs directly in the browser. This is like the dash dash target flag for Java, for example. Um, and for when we're doing a, an optimization, we want to hand it the higher level language syntax, because the optimizers can do more if you haven't already down leveled all the syntax. Um, so uh, this is one place where I think Bazel um, can do something that no other make like build tool can do, which is that um, if I want my individual libraries in this, in this example to be producing one of these two different outputs, depending on what rule depends on it, um, you can actually have the like library one in this example would produce different outputs depending on whether the dev mode is requesting it versus whether the production bundler is, is requesting it. Um, the other thing uh, about JavaScript is that it's a crazy world. It's not, um, it's this flavor of the month. A uh, very diverse tool chain is a nice way of saying flavor of the month. Um, so everybody's always making a new optimizer or a new compiler or a new language or a new syntax. It's, it's very, uh, like, all you have to do is publish to NPM. It doesn't, you don't have to pay anything to publish to NPM, so everybody does it. Um, some people do it multiple times a day. So uh, unfortunately, those things are they, they're not really well engineered. They're kind of developed um, very rapidly. So uh, in particular, like, we're not looking down at anybody who's developing this stuff, but the, the real problem we end up with is that you end up with these layering violations. So for example, in Angular, we have to produce syntax in the output that exactly happens to correlate with some feature in the bundler in order to not have a deoptimization happen. And so a lot of these tools will ex have just some ex expectation about the inputs, and then other tools have to, uh, have to work around that or, or conform. Um, so let me hand it over to Mike to talk a little bit about um, what he's built. OK, yeah, so uh, we've been using TypeScript at Asana for several years now. Our code base initially used to be all JavaScript. Uh, now we have um, mostly TypeScript for the front end and, um, and Scala for the back end. And um, we uh, decided to use Bazel as our build tool. We've been using it for at least a year and a half, maybe two years now. Uh, Asana is a pretty, um, a pretty large, uh, sophisticated application uh, for doing uh, work tracking. Uh, and, uh, so um, this is, there's a lot of JavaScript, a lot of JavaScript uh, downloaded to the browser in the in the main bundle. Um, in our TypeScript source code, we have about 150 Bazel packages, and each file, each package has about uh, roughly 20 files or so. Um, so big, not huge, but big. Um, and um, the uh, and the TypeScript compiler is actually um, pretty fast. Um, but we found that our wall clock time for a clean compile uh, was about is about five minutes, uh, quite a lot longer than we want. Obviously, you're not doing clean compiles that often, uh, you know, because because Bazel and because uh, it's 
uh, we're also using the remote cache capabilities of Bazel. Um, but sometimes you are. If you're modifying, in our case, if you're modifying a file that's part of our um, our data model, that'll touch some higher up files in the tree, in the, in the um, hierarchy of dependencies. Um, so two seconds to compile a TypeScript package is, is uh, quite good, but there are 150 of them, so it adds up. Um, so we wanted to see if we could uh, improve the compile time overall. And you know, there are certain parallels to, um, to uh, what the Pinterest guys were, were talking about earlier in terms of you know, certain roadblocks you run into and you know, try various, various strategies to, um, to address them. Persistent workers is a, uh, are a feature of Bazel that um, worked out really well for us. Uh, Bazel, you can, you, if you have a tool that understands uh, how, how, to, how to act as a persistent worker, uh, basically it launches once and it stays in memory after that, accepting uh, jobs from Bazel and, um, and then returning results without, so you know, if you have a compiler, it can, you can launch it once, and then it can read standard in uh, in a protobuf format, um, do its compilation, and then write any error messages or other output to standard out, also in a protobuf format. So Bazel launches your tool with this dash dash persistent worker argument. And, and by the way, the reason I'm, part of the reason I'm telling you all this is we, we did this for TypeScript. You can do it yourself if you have other tools in your tool chain uh, that are that are adaptable to this um, to this process. Um, so, uh, and by the way, uh, Java's I mean Bazel's um, built-in Java compiler is a persistent worker, uh, and they they got a big speed up from doing that. So, TSC is the um, TypeScript compiler. So, if you have a one line .ts file, it compiles one line of TypeScript and 19,000 lines of lib.d.ts. DTS files are um, they're, they're declaration files. They're sort of like the TypeScript equivalent of a .h file. They, have, they list, you know, because TypeScript's main point is to give you uh, type checking, it has, to, it has to read this file to, to find all the type declarations for the standard library. Um, and, um, even, and again, 19,000 is a lot, but it's only two seconds. Um, but if you can do that, if you can read that once and keep it in memory, then you can save quite a bit of time. Uh, in the case of Asana, we also have some other large DTS files. So we'll have a tree of dependencies. You know, we'll have some, some core packages, and then we'll have other packages that depend on those. So like if we compile a core, if we compile one Bazel package, its output is a JavaScript file and a DTS file so that other packages can, can you know, see the type declarations. So one typical Asana package had only 894 lines of TypeScript and 81,000 lines of DTS files. Um, you don't want to be reparsing that all the time. Um, TSC is the TypeScript compiler. And for this package, in a test I ran, it took uh, 2.3 seconds. Uh, with Bazel TSC, which is the little tool we wrote, it took 400 milliseconds. Um, so this cut our total build time from five minutes down to about a minute and a half. Um, I initially, by the way, Bazel TSC is the name of the tool. I initially called it Bazel TSC, but with a dash, Bazel dash TSC, and I was getting weird, mysterious errors. <laughs> and it's because anything Bazel dash, you know, Bazel dash bin, Bazel dash uh, <laughs> there was something somewhere that was just deleting it, so I changed the name. <laughs> Um, so we wrote Bazel TSC about six months ago, and uh, and then uh, in parallel to that, we didn't uh, realize that Google was actually working on on their TypeScript tools. Uh, so so ours is in GitHub and npm as Bazel TSC, and they have another uh, package called Rules underscore TypeScript. Uh, and I'll talk a little about uh, just a very high level overview of yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay, on the next slide, I'll do that. Um, Rules TypeScript is sort of a complete drop-in solution for, for using TypeScript. Um, and it's probably a little easier to get started with. Uh, and it also, by the way, has a persistent worker, which is um, implemented a little differently from ours. Uh, Bazel TSC was really focused on the speed issue and, and was initially created for our own internal use. So, um, so there will be a little more messing around you have to do with, um, with 
the Skylark rules, getting them just right. Um, but we've been very happy with it. We've been using it, like I said, for six months, and uh, the it's the performance has been great. And the incremental compilation, by the way, has been rock solid, uh, which I think the TypeScript open source project gets some of the credit for that in the sense that when you give it an incremental change, it I've never once seen an error from it. Um, so how do you make a persistent worker? Uh, Bazel has build strategies. Uh, I think there was a little bit of talk about that earlier, but uh, in some of the earlier talks, you know, there's the um, standalone, which is a regular local build. Sandbox, which is always better than standalone, that's a, but that's also a local build. And a re remote build, and um, one of the strategies is worker. And that's, and that's what you pass if you, if you want Bazel to, um, to invoke your tool with the dash dash persistent worker flag. You also, in the Skylark file, uh, you need to say this execution requirements equals supports workers colon one. Um, uh, one other point I want to mention about build strategies. So um, when we were doing this work a few months ago, the you could build as with the worker strategy, or you could build using the remote cache, but you couldn't do both. Now uh, I think there is a flag experimental remote spawn cache. I think that's the name of the flag. Okay, um, which will which will let you uh, use both together. Um, so that's definitely helpful. So a typical uh, build file. So so this is all this is all the implementation gory details that are in the Skylark file, and you won't have to worry about this very often. Most of the time, you'll just be writing a build file. And TSC is the name of our rule. Name equals my package. Sources equals list of sources. And then it outputs the JS file, the source map, and uh, the DTS file. Um, it's pretty simple. And uh, like I said, I touched on this a little bit, but the the compiler API gives us uh, it's it's a it's a it's a very well architected modular um, piece of code in in the TypeScript compiler. It was designed, in fact, from the beginning to be that way, so that IDEs, any IDE, uh, not just ones for Microsoft, sort you know, sort of created TypeScript uh, in the same way that Google created Bazel. TypeScript is open source, but Microsoft sort of drives the project, and um, they created it to be, uh, you know, so you could get uh, autocomplete and go to definition and things like that from any IDE. Um, so even, you know, there are Vim extensions or um, IntelliJ, ex uh, you know, extensions that all use the same TypeScript backend. Um, and, um, and so they wanted to make it rich enough to support things like, um, you know, if the user is typing in a file, it doesn't want to recompile the whole file every time Every time he types a line of code, uh, so um, so it can it can cache the full uh, AST or abstract syntax tree of a file, and it can also cache the um, the symbol table bindings. If you refer to you know a variable foo, um, it will once um, find the right foo to bind that to for um, for type checking, um, and um, let's see. Okay, so. Our uh, tool is at github.com slash asana slash basil tsc. If you want to try it, if you want to if you want to use it, you just use npm um, with the command line shown here. And um, and I think we have time to do a quick demo. So the prompt is too long. So I'm gonna shorten it. Uh, Yay, old school. OK. Um, so I am going to, um, there's nothing here. I'm going to create a, a dummy uh, node project. OK, so now I just have a package.json. Then I'm going to install Bazel TSC. Uh, if you've done node before, there are regular dependencies and there are dev dependencies. The dev dependencies are only needed at build time. So I'm going to say npm install. Save dev, Bazel TSC. Okay, and um, it did print a warning here. 
Bazel TSC requires a peer of TypeScript greater than or equal to 2.0.2, but none is installed. So peer dependencies, if you haven't used those, are, you know, it's like you install it yourself, you decide which version you want and install it, but this tool is going to be looking for TypeScript. So we'll just install that, npm install, save dev, TypeScript. You're not seeing me do any Bazel here. This is more just a demo of this uh, of this tool. OK, so now if I, let's create a one line TypeScript file. It's going to be exciting. Console.log, hello, Bazel conference. OK, so to compile it, so Bazel TSC has three ways it can run. The way it'll run most of the time is with dash dash persistent worker. Uh, and like I said, it's accepting protobuf on standard in. Um, I don't know how to type protobuf from the keyboard. Maybe you're better at that than I am. But, uh, but it has a dash dash debug flag, which lets you just type commands in and use it in the same way. So if I do node modules dot bin slash Bazel TSC dash dash debug. OK, so now I have a prompt, and I can basically give it a full TSC build line with any flags or or arguments. So I can just say x.ts, and it compiles it. And it says compilation took 1,052 milliseconds. And now let's try it again, x.ts, and it took 471 milliseconds that time. Uh, again, the difference is because of the lib.d.ts, which was already cached before. Um, and obviously, this is also not showing the difference in startup time of the of the compiler. OK, Alex? All right. So yeah, that's um, the, 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 the ability to do this with persistent workers is something that we take advantage of within Google also. Um, and the rules TypeScript uh, package um, does the same thing. Uh, I want to talk about a couple other additional things that we do to make things fast in TypeScript, not exhaustive list at all. Um, so as Mike mentioned before, we have these .d.ts files that are like header files. And if you're familiar with the way Bazel does incremental compilation, those are going to be the inputs um, to an action that depends on some library. So if a library A is compiled and it produces a DTS file, that's the input to the next library B that depends on it. Um, and so of course, uh, as long as we keep our compilations in these packages independent, then we don't have to do a cascading rebuild. If we make a change, it should only rebuild um, the, thing that's, the things that are affected. So the time there is proportional to what you've changed. Um, not surprising to any of you, but if you go to a JavaScript conference and you say, hey, our build tool is incremental, people are surprised. Um, <laughs> and that and the, you know, the, the build is not always clean is surprising to them. Um, and of course, it's parallelizable. So one of the things you get with workers is that you parallelize over as many cores as you have on the machine. I think by default, you get one core left over for the user to use. So I took this screenshot um, over with the team that's using Angular while their compiling compilation was going on. And all 12 CPUs were maxed out doing TypeScript compilation. To you guys, that might seem like, ah, oh, why do you have so much TypeScript code? To me, this is very exciting that this works. <laughs> um, it's faster than if it was one CPU. Um, but of course, um, of course, we have the Bazel build farm. We're all interested in um, the remote action execution. This is something that I think um, Angular users are going to benefit a lot from. Uh, it was exciting to hear from Ulf this morning that, um, that we're, there's going to be an experimental one offered by Google. Um, I think this is going to be a big deal for, for uh, test parallelization as well. Um, and then there's one last thing I wanted to bring up, which is um, kind of my pet project. And we just launched at the end of last week. So this is my first chance to talk about it. Um, so this is actually Java, which I used to, I worked in Java before I moved to the Angular team. And at the bottom of this log, there's a link to errorprone.info. So this was my 20% project. Um, we, we were doing static analysis. And we said, hey, this is wasting the developer's time. And if you think about the, the, the latency of the compiler, what the user cares about is partly they care how quickly you can produce the output. But then they also care about how quickly their program works. And so if we look at it holistically, what's the real user perceived latency? It includes finding their mistakes. And so um, this is a cool way to say, hey, like there's this basically there's a bug in the Java code up here. It's too small for you all to find it. I'm sure you would very quickly. Um, and we can point it out in the compilation. So what we just did is the same thing for TypeScript, uh, maybe called Tsitsi, which is a bug that starts with TS. Um, so this code on the top, we call this.values.filter. Filter has no side effects. So it's always wrong to throw away the return value. And now our TypeScript compiler tells you that. And the reason I'm mentioning it in this talk is that one of the advantages for us hosting the TypeScript compiler inside of Bazel is that we can also do more things that Bazel is good at, like static analysis um, and tooling for being able to, for example, uh, everywhere inside of Google, we had to fix this before we could turn this on. And so we can use things like extra actions to automatically apply fixes across the whole repository. 
So that stuff is cool, and I'm very excited that we're starting to do that in TypeScript. I think there are a lot more examples like this of a program that's obviously wrong, you can tell at compile time, and the developers should always say, but the compiler could have caught that, and as the compiler at people, we should take, take uh, pay attention to that. Um, so uh, we're wrapping up. So first of all, um, uh, there'll be a link to the slides at the end. So here are a bunch of links to the various rules. Um, so the ones I work on at Google, so we have um, the Node.js rules to give you the Node runtime to run JavaScript. Then there's at Bazel slash TypeScript, which is where you can get the rules TypeScript package. There's at Angular slash Bazel, which is where you get the Angular rules to compile, run the Angular compiler in Bazel. And then I have this example repo, Angular Bazel example, that ties it all together, um, at least whichever bits are currently live, which is not the whole thing yet. Uh, here's a link to the Asana rules. And also, um, this is open source. It's great, right? All of us are writing this stuff. At the same time, I know Paul Johnson is here who wrote the PubRef one of these. A couple other companies already wrote their own node rules. Um, so you know, uh, please, please be open source um, savvy and, and contribute to these or open source the rules you have, and let's all learn from each other. Uh, the current state of these things, so as Mike said, you can use this stuff now for TypeScript code. Um, we are missing a level of interoperability, which has uh, been on my plate for a while, something we need to do. So the idea is if you use, let's say, use the TSC rule that Mike showed, and then later you want to swap it out for TS library, the outputs don't look exactly the same. And so rules downstream that have a dependency on those may, may or may not still work. And it depends, of course, in, in, in Bazel, there are explicit output files, so .js files. But then there are implicit outputs, and there are things that could be accessed through Skylark aspects, like the providers. And so the API is not exactly the same. So we need to figure out what the interoperability there should be. Uh, and that's also a prerequisite for using other JavaScript are where rules in the ecosystem. So for example, rules closure runs Google's closure compiler as an optimizer. That doesn't work yet with, uh, with my TypeScript rules. I don't know if it works with, with yours yet. I don't know. Um, other things that are going on, the Angular team is switching, or switching our own build over to Bazel because we have a gigantic build. It's been a shell script for a couple of years. It's pretty bad. Um, and at the same time, as soon as we can we compile Angular itself, then we will have all the rules needed for our users to switch. Um, and my long-term vision, the work I'm doing, is that eventually everybody uses the Angular CLI, which is most of the Angular developers. Um, the build system is hidden from them. It's currently Webpack, but they don't, there's no visibility of it. And so we could change the build system to Bazel once we get this stuff mature, which would be cool. There's like a million of those people. Um, OK, so last thing, next steps. Um, slides link is here. Make sure you take a picture if you want before the slide goes away. Um, so if you, if you happen to use both Angular and Bazel, I talked to one team today that does that, um, please talk to me, because I'm interested in finding early adopters for the Angular rules. Um, and if you want to implement your own persistent workers or you want to know more about how they work, um, come talk to Mike. And, um, and lastly, if you use JavaScript, which probably a lot of your companies do somewhere, um, definitely think about using TypeScript, and uh, Bazel is a great build tool for it. <laughs>